Today I want you to turn with me to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. I hope you've brought your Bibles because we want to talk about a very important subject today. The judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end of the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of Second Peter. Now, Second Peter in your Bibles comes right after First Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you. If you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral saturated body of water which is 1260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan, and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around, and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah, and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go, we've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. 
but at that time it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter when he says that. They had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They live for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful and the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent toward Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent toward Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. But the powers of evil 
will overcome you and you will die before your time and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says, There are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we've forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then, in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1, it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now, God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while he said 30, then 20. Finally he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, you'd be turned to a pillar of salt 
Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world, and many are like Demas, having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now, the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ, because the Scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom, and evil and the devil are going to be eliminated, and this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and the, all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world, God so loved this present world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. For How will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God. What trump that trumpets that'll be? Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you... If you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow and he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins. And you're not sure that you've repented. To surrender totally to Christ. Your heart, your mind, your body, your life. So that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. 
get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. And you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay, because he says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation, or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are, God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ. So can you, right where you are. Just call the phone number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this important decision, so... Here in this great Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here, you have heard the message. And God has spoken to you. And we've seen hundreds of people come here. Many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent. And help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing. And help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. There's still time for you to make that important decision. Take a moment right now to call the number on your screen. Someone will pray with you and talk with you about your spiritual condition and the hope and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Call right now. This concludes our spring television series. We're so glad you joined us. Guys. For amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties, above the fruited plain, America, America. Good with brother.
from sea to shining sea. I don't know how you feel, but I feel proud tonight to be an American. This year, most of our crusades have been abroad, and we have been in various parts of the world holding evangelistic crusades like this. Next year, we're staying the entire year in the United States, holding crusades from one end of the country to the other and participating in scores of bicentennial events because we believe that the greatest service we can make to America in her bicentennial year will be to strengthen the spiritual strength that we do have in this country and pray that God will make next year, 1976, a year of spiritual revival and renewal in this nation. I believe that if we Americans will make it a year of prayer, we can see what could happen to this nation in just one year. And I hope that all of you will be participating in that. Tonight, I want to turn again to what could be called a Christmas text, though I wasn't thinking of it when I prepared this message. But it's the 14th verse of the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. Just one verse. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I want to speak tonight on the subject of biblical peace. How do we have peace? Luke 12, 49, our same Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. I am come to send fire on the earth, he said. I have come to send fire on the earth. And then Matthew 10, 34, he says something else very strange. He says, think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace but a sword. It sounds like a contradiction. It sounds like he didn't know what he was talking about. He was announced as the Prince of Peace in the Old Testament. He came in fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. The angels announced him as the one that was going to bring peace. And now when he reaches the age of 30 years of age and he enters upon his ministry, he said, I have come to bring fire on the earth. And he says, I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. How do we reconcile it? What did he mean? There are those who've tried to reduce Christ to the level of a genial innocuous a Pisa but Christ said you're wrong I'm a fire setter I'm a sword wielder this generation has been called the tormented generation and the reason that it's been called that is because it's an age of revolution a technological revolution that is causing other revolutions throughout the world. Political revolutions. Old orders are dying and new orders are coming into being. Nations are being overthrown by revolution almost weekly as we read in our newspapers. And on that tragic day here in Texas, that November day, 1963, President Kennedy had prepared to say to the Dallas Citizens Council these words. We, in this generation, are by destiny rather than by choice watchmen on the walls of world freedom. We did not seek this responsibility, but we will not shrink from it. The 20th century will be called the century of revolution, and the whole world order is changing and changing rapidly right now, morally, Structurally, in business, labor, government, everything is in, a, is in change and in crisis. 
God loves our world. He loves you so much that he gave his son to die on the cross to bring peace. And the Bible teaches three kinds of peace. Only three. First, there is peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, said the Apostle Paul in Romans 5.1. The greatest need that you have right now tonight as an individual is peace with God. You say, well, Billy, I'm not at war with God. Yes, you are. You may not be conscious of it. God calls it war because you are in rebellion against him. You don't do his will. You haven't yielded your life as, to him as Lord and Master and Savior. Oh, you're a member of the church. You're a fairly decent person. But the Bible says we don't even know our hearts. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Now, that's how God looks at it. I go to the Mayo Clinic every year for an examination, and they always give me an x-ray, and they usually find a little something wrong somewhere inside of me. And on two or three occasions, they've operated because of what they saw in the x-ray. I didn't know it was there, but the x-ray shows it up. You see, you don't know that you're rebelling against God. You're not quite conscious of it. You're not shaking your fist in God's face. But you're not go living according to the Word of God. You're not giving time to prayer. You're not giving time to Bible study. You're not giving time to soul winning. You're not giving everything that you possibly could give. And so God looks upon you and God pronounces the verdict and the diagnosis is that your heart is sinful. That's God's diagnosis. That's the way he looks at you. He says you're a sinner. You've broken my laws. You're in rebellion against me. And what you need is reconciliation. And the greatest need that we have tonight is reconciliation with God. How do you get reconciled with God? That's what the cross is all about. On the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ reached one hand and took the hand of God and the other hand and took your hand and brought us together and reconciled us to God at the cross. And you can only find God at the cross. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was over here recently, remember. And he toured around the country and he told a little story that everybody ought to hear if you didn't hear it. He said when he was in that prison for so long, there came one time and one time only when he thought of suicide. He said he was not allowed ever to speak to his cellmate. For weeks on end, they could not speak to each other. And he said that his cellmate saw him growing weaker and weaker and more depressed and more discouraged all the time. And he said his cellmate took a little stick And in the sand or the dirt in the cell, he drew a picture of the cross. And Solzhenitsyn said, at that moment, the whole purpose of my existence dawned upon me. Because he said, I realized that Jesus Christ shed his blood for me on that cross. And he said, that gave me the courage to live through my imprisonment. Have you come to that cross? Not with all your religious trappings, not with all your pretenses and pride, but have you come in great humility and said, oh Lord, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry and I'm willing for you to come into my life and change my life and change my way of living. I talked to a man this afternoon in a distant city, goes to church, sits on the front row. He said, I'm going to commit suicide in just a few minutes. I've become so depressed. I prayed with him. He promised to wait at least another 48 hours before he commits suicide. 
Are the pressures of life pressing in on you like that? The suicide rate in this country is rising every hour as people are coming to the end of themselves. And some of it is right in the church. People who have religion but ha do not have Jesus Christ. A pastor in this town told me yesterday, he said, Billy, the greatest problem we face in West Texas is that we have religion, but we don't really know Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he was a religious man. Peace with God, that's why Christ died. That's why he rose again. That's what the cross is all about. Christ did his part on the cross in dying for you. Now you must receive him. You see, God is willing to offer you a pardon. He'll pardon you and forgive you. But more than that, he will change you here and now. And you begin eternal life, not when you die, you begin eternal life tonight, right now. And you can have heaven on earth, joy and peace and security in the midst of a world that's crumbling. In fact, that's what peace means. Peace means tranquility no matter what the circumstances. Let the bombs fall, let the wars come. Let the world tear apart. Let your husband leave you, your wife leave you. Let death come to the family. All these things will cause tears, yes, but in the midst of it is peace because you have peace with God. And that brings us to our second point. There's the peace of God. Peace with God now. Now peace of God. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now the world can give you a peace. You can go out here and get drunk and get a little peace. You can go out and take some drugs and have some little peace and tranquility for a short time. You can go out here and have a sex experience, have an affair. And you'll have a little peace and a little fun and a little merriment, a little joy for a little while. The Bible says this pleasure in sin for a short season. But then comes the terrible moment of truth when you must face reality, when you must face God, you must face the judgment, you must face eternity. And you don't have the peace of God. And the greatest legacy that Christ left us was his peace. He said, my peace I give unto you. Think of the serenity with which Jesus Christ moved in his life. He wasn't hurrying about here and there like we do. He seemed to take time with everybody. He only had three years. He could have fed all the hungry people in the world. With one wave of his, of his arm, he could have stopped all the wars, but he didn't do it. That wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that he would go to the cross and take your sins. You see, God couldn't be just and just forgive you. God couldn't come along and pat you on the back and say, Jim, Bill, Susie, Mary, I forgive you. I know you've broken my law and you've sinned. You see, to us, sin seems trivial. It doesn't seem serious. But in God's sight, it's deadly serious. It means eternal death. It means judgment. God is a just God, absolutely just. Somebody had to bear the punishment. Somebody had to spend the time in the prison. Someone had to suffer the pangs of hell and judgment. And Jesus Christ stepped out and said, I will. And he took your judgment and your hell. And when he was on that cross, he said to the people that were driving the nails in his hands, he prayed to the Father, he said, Father, forgive them too. They don't even know what they're doing. I expect to see the men that drove the nails in his hands, I expect to see them in heaven. Because I believe that God answered the prayer of his son that day. 
There's never been a person that called upon the Lord even with a sigh or a breath and said, Lord, remember the thief on the cross? He deserved death. He deserved to die. He was a murderer. He was a robber. And all he did was turn to Jesus Christ and say, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Remember me. That's all. That quick. People say, Well, you can't come to Christ that quick and have your life changed like that. You certainly can. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were singing and they were witnessing and the jailer was listening. And the prison walls fell down in an earthquake and it looked like the prisoners were escaping and the jailer drew his sword. He was going to kill himself because he knew the Roman authorities would kill him the next day for letting the prisoners escape. And Paul said, wait a minute. We haven't fled. We're still here. And the man fell down in terror. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And you know what the average person would say to him? Why, you're in no emotional state to be saved. Wait till you calm down. Think about it. Let's, let's, let's meet and talk this out tomorrow and explain it to you. Paul didn't do that. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Just believe right now, here. And at that moment, that Philippian jailer received Christ, was saved and was forgiven, and before the night was over, he was doing social work because it says that he washed the backs of the prisoners whom he had beaten just a few hours earlier. Just like that, your life can be changed. You can be touched by Christ tonight and never be the same again. And then thirdly and lastly, there is peace with our fellow men. Jesus said, have peace with one another. In other words, we are to work for peace. We are to do all that Mr. Kissinger has been doing. But man himself without God will never bring permanent peace. Thousands of peace treaties have been signed in the history of the world. And we still have wars. Is there going to be a day and a time when we will have no more war? Yes, there is coming a day. Listen to what the scripture says. And he shall rule the nations, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Isaiah 2, 4. That's going to happen. War will be eliminated. Peace will come. And then the scripture says in another place, and in that day, I will make a covenant for them with the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle of the earth. And all will lie down safely together. Did you see the picture the other night on television how the insects are about to take the world? And there's a battle right now as to whether man is going to survive by 2000 A.D. or whether the insects are going to survive. And we're at war with the insect world because they're moving so fast. Here it says those little creeping things, these insects, we're going to be at peace with. The animal world we'll be at peace with. You can have a tiger in your living room just like you have a cat now. It's going to be a wonderful time. There'll be no tears. No suffering, no hospitals, no armies, no navies, no wars, and no death, no graveyards, a wonderful, glorious world to come. What will be the government? The United Nations? No. Theocracy. God reigning. God will be in charge, and he will rule the world the scripture says with a rod of iron that means with perfect justice and perfect love and perfect mercy that's the future and I want to tell you tonight I've staked everything I've got ever will have on the promise of that word I'm trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone as my Lord and my Savior and when my moment comes to die 
If I should die before he comes, I know that there will be an angel that will come and take me by the hand and usher me into the presence of my Lord, and I will be with him forever. I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here. I know where I'm going, and I don't have any doubts about it. You can have that same peace, that same assurance, that same joy by putting your confidence and your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to ask you to do it tonight. How? I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of the platform and make this commitment to Christ openly. You say, well, Billy, why do we have to come forward? Because Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men openly, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And every person that he called in the New Testament, he called publicly. There was a reason for it. If you're ashamed of following Christ, then you're no follower of his. He wants you to come out and be open about it. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to come out tonight and be open about it. You may be a member of the best church in town. Or you may not be a member of any church. You may be Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. Or you may not have any religion. But you want to come and give your heart and your life to him tonight. And you want to make sure about this thing. You want his peace. You want his forgiveness. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want to choose his side tonight. You get up and come. If you're with friends that have come in a bus, they'll wait on you. Bring your friend with you. It'll only take two or three minutes. And after you've come, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. You get up and come right now. If you come from that top balcony, it takes about a minute longer. So get up and come right now, quickly, from everywhere. And all of you back here that God has spoken to, and all around, you get up and come. We're going to wait. Television can see here at Texas Tech University Stadium hundreds of people coming across this field to make this commitment to Jesus Christ and to find peace with God and the peace that passeth all understanding. That peace, that purpose, that joy can be yours. Wherever you are in a hotel room, in your living room, your bedroom at home, you can say yes to Christ. God bless you. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today, I want you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, the 11th chapter. The 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel, beginning with verse 29. Beginning with verse 29. I hope you have your Bibles. How many have a Bible today? Lift them up. Look at the Bibles, thousands of Bibles everywhere. Now the 29th chapter, or the 11th chapter and the 29th verse of Luke's Gospel. 
And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto Nineveh, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Now, ancient Israel wanted Jesus to do something sensational to prove that he was really the Son of God. But Jesus is saying in this passage, you're seeking for a sign. All right, I'll give you a sign. I am the sign. And Jesus was saying that the people of Jonah's day listened to the message of God and repented and they're going to rise up at the judgment as witnesses against the people of Jesus' day that rejected him. He said the queen of the south recognized the wisdom of Solomon, but he said in me you have a greater wisdom than all the wisdom of Solomon. He said you're blind. You cannot see the truth. You're deaf and you cannot hear the truth. He said I'm the truth. I'm the light of the world. I'm the sign. Now, when you face Jesus, what is your reaction? When you're confronted with Jesus Christ, what is your reaction? The reaction of the scribes and the Pharisees was one of hostility. The people of Nineveh's day were humbled and repented when they faced and confronted God. And the question that we all ask today is this question. What think ye of Christ? There's a rock opera at the moment called Jesus Christ the Superstar. All over the country, thousands of young people are talking about Christ. They can't escape him. There's a Broadway play right now entitled Godspell a musical version of St. Matthew's Gospel. There's a new movie right now called Brother John in which Sidney Poitier plays Jesus Christ in the form of an Alabama black man. The front cover of Life magazine a few weeks ago ran Jesus Christ Superstar. And this rock opera from England was confronting young people with one question. Who is Jesus Christ, an 87-minute long electronic probe into the life of Jesus. Who is Jesus? And the opera concludes with the voice of Judas coming back from the dead and still questioning who Jesus is. Don't get me wrong, says Judas in the opera. I only want to know. And then the haunting chorus follows Jesus Christ Superstar. Do you think you are what they say you are? Jesus Christ, do you think you are what they say you are? Well, we know some things about him. We know he was a man. Jesus was completely human. He was representative of man because the Bible says he was identified he was numbered with the transgressors we know that he was hungry we know he got thirsty we know he got tired we know that he had the joys of friendship we know that he wept at the tomb of a dead loved one we know that he had all the characteristics of a man and yet very interestingly the Bible says that he never committed a sin in fact, he stood in front of the people of his generation and he said, I've never committed a sin. He said, have any of you, my neighbors, ever seen me commit a sin? 
They couldn't say a thing. Now, wouldn't that be something for a man to come along, 33 years of age, and say, who of you have ever seen me commit a sin? Well, I'll tell you, if I said that, all my team would jump straight up and say, I have. My wife's here. All of us are sinners, but Jesus was tempted in every point like as we are. He went through every temptation you've ever been through. There isn't a trial or a testing or a temptation that Jesus has not been through before you, and he resisted them and overcame them all. Everyone, he was a man just like you. But he was more than that. He claimed to be the unique, only begotten, incarnate Son of God. In fact, he claimed pre-existence. The Scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Before time began, he existed. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am in eternal existence. No wonder they got angry. No wonder they threw stones at him. No wonder they tried to kill him. And no wonder they eventually did crucify him. He stood and said, I am God. Was he? Was he who the, he claimed to be? the Son of the living God? One day he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter answered and said, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist come back, or you're Jeremiah, or you're Elijah. He said, I'm really not interested in what the people say. I'm interested, Peter, in what you say. What do you say? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, you've done well. You've passed your examination. But Peter, those are not your thoughts. Those thoughts came from God. It has been revealed to you by God. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of the living God. And you know, at his incarnation, or his birth, that was not his birth, or that wasn't the beginning, that wasn't the origin of Jesus. That was the beginning, that was the beginning of his incarnation. Because he has always existed. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God, the Bible says. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the Logos, the Word of God, the eternal God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and lived like a man among us. That's what the Bible teaches. And when you come to Jesus Christ, you have to accept that. He wasn't just another revolutionary. He wasn't just another hippie. He was not just another great man. He was God in the flesh. And oh, the ethics that he taught. Never a man spake like that man. When you get hit on one side, he says, turn the other cheek. He never said what to do after that. But he did say, forgive 70 times 7, count that up. How about the little irritations from your wife or your husband? 70 times 7 you forgive. My wife once said that the secret of a happy marriage is two good forgivers. And that's what it is. Two good forgivers. People that can forgive each other. Jesus taught that we're to forgive. He taught a revolution in the way we're to live. He taught us that it wasn't just our outward actions that God judges, but it's the inward thoughts and intents. He said, Moses said that in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you even look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed it. 
He said, Moses said, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, if you have hate in your heart against your brother without cause, you're already guilty. He lifted man's ethics to the highest plane and demanded that we live that kind of a life. And then look at the death he died. Did ever a man die like Jesus? The lightning flashed and the thunder roared and the earth began to shake. And even the soldiers confessed that this must be the Son of God. Anyone that can see Jesus on that cross and not be touched has a heart of stone. They first took off his clothes. Then they took long leather thongs with steel pellets or lead pellets on the end and beat him across the back until he could hardly stand up. Then they put a crown of thorns on his brow and his face was bleeding. And they laughed at him and they spit on him and they mocked him. And with one snap of his finger, 72,000 angels had already drawn their swords ready to come to his rescue and wipe this planet out of existence in the universe. And Jesus said, no, to this end was I born. And he dragged and lifted and hauled that cross. And don't you black people ever forget one thing. The man that helped Jesus carry that cross was a black man. And don't ever forget another thing. Jesus belongs to Africa as much as he does to Europe and Asia. He was born in that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe, and Jesus was not a white man like me, nor was he as black as some of you. We don't know what the color of his skin, but it must have been a dark color like the people of his day because he was a man like them. Don't ever say it's a white man's religion or a black man's religion. It's a world religion. He belongs to the world. <laughs> when he died on that cross, and they nailed him, they put the nails in his hands. And you know what he said? Forgive them, they know not what they do. Forgive them. Could you forgive somebody that's putting nails in your hands and you know you didn't deserve it? He didn't squirm, he didn't yell, he didn't scream. He just took it and said, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's how he confronted the violence of his death. And then, on the cross, he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he dropped his head and said, it's finished. What did he mean? He meant your plan of salvation was finished. God can now forgive you of all your sins because Jesus had finished God's plan for your salvation. Because you see, God knows every one of you by name. He has the hairs of your head numbered. God looks upon you as though you were the only person in the whole universe. He sees you and you alone. And on that cross, Jesus had the capacity to think of you. And he loved you enough to stay on the cross. Was there ever such love as that when he could have been rescued and taken back to heaven and to sit on his throne, but he didn't? He said, no. I'm doing it for the joy that is set before me because he saw that he would be raised from the dead. He saw that there would be a gathering in the generations to come of a people for his name that would make up his body. He saw the day when we will reign with him in his kingdom. Yes, they laid him away in a tomb and that's where Jesus Christ superstar leaves him. But out in Kansas City, some people got hold of the rock opera and they carried it right on to the next step, the resurrection. And if you don't have the resurrection, you don't have any gospel. Jesus Christ is alive. 
And when they went out to the tomb that morning, they heard the greatest news the world has ever known. He is not here. He is risen. He is alive today. And the thing that inspired the disciples to turn the world upside down in their day was the resurrection. They went everywhere declaring that Jesus is alive. If Jesus claimed to be God knowing he wasn't God, then he's a liar. And we will have to say, Jesus, you're a liar. You're a fraud and a hoax and you're the biggest fraud in the history of the human race. Or, if Jesus thought he was God and did not know the difference, then he desperately needed mental help. He needed several psychiatrists. The third alternative is that he was who he claims to be, God in the flesh. I believe that the evidence is overwhelming that he is who he claims to be, the son of the living God. But I cannot prove it scientifically. But I can prove it by the lives that he transforms every day. I can prove it because in my heart, I don't say I think, I hope, I say I know. And you know, there's another element in our lives that we don't think much about, and that's the element of faith. You think of the faith that you have to have every day. You have to have faith that your wife didn't put poison in your coffee this morning. You have to have faith in her. She might have felt like it, but she didn't. You have to have faith in the bank. When you write a check and sign it and you have money in the bank, you have to have faith that the bank's going to pay it. You have to have faith in the government. When you pull out a dollar bill, now I know it's shrinking, but you have faith that back of it is a dollar, that people will accept it as money. Everything we do is by faith. Now, for example, when I come up on a hill and I live in the mountains of North Carolina and we have a lot of hills, I don't stop my car before I get to the crest of the hill and get out and walk over and see if somebody's coming up the other side on the wrong side. I have faith to believe that the drivers are going to stay on their side. Faith, 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 everything. When you sat in that chair, had you ever sat in that chair before? I bet you didn't pick it up and examine it and put your hands on it to see if it would hold you. By faith, you just sat down in it. You had faith that people wouldn't build a chair that wouldn't hold you. Everything we do is by faith. All right, take the same faith. Put it in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will know who Jesus is. You accept him by faith, and he comes into your life and into your heart, and you know that he's who he claims to be. On that Damascus road that I referred to a moment ago, the Apostle Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? And then Paul asked him another question. Paul said, What do you want me to do, Lord? And Jesus said, Arise and go. I'm asking you today to arise and come to him. Now, some of you can ridicule. Some of you can reject him. Some can just put it off and say, I'm going to wait till another time. Or you can accept him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master and the Son of God. And he will come into your heart and forgive your sin and change your life. Jesus Christ, superstar. Judas, don't get me wrong, I only want to know, he said. And then the haunting chorus, Jesus Christ, superstar, do you think you are what they say you are? Yes! And more, 10,000 times more than two men in England ever put in those lyrics is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
and you are asked today to receive him. In fact, if you're going to go to heaven, the Bible teaches, you have to receive him. If you're going to have your sins forgiven, you have to receive him. And I'm going to ask you to do it today, and I'm going to ask you to do it publicly. How do you do it? I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front of this platform quietly and reverently and say, I want Christ in my heart. I want him to forgive my sin. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want him to change my life. I receive him as my Lord and Savior. If you're with friends or relatives or in a delegation, they'll wait. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. Why do I ask you to come forward? Because every person Jesus ever called in the New Testament, he called publicly. You come publicly and openly and declare yourself. You may be Protestant, you may be Catholic, you may be Jewish, you may be Orthodox, or you may not have any religion. But God has spoken to you today and you know that you need Christ. You come and make sure right now we're going to wait. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the service, please, not at this holy moment. I know you want to go because of the crowd, but don't leave. Just get up and come right now, quickly, from everywhere, hundreds of you. We're going to wait. From all over the stadium, as God is speaking, you may be in the choir, and this may be your last moment with God. You may never have another hour like this. You come. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You're watching the Billy Graham Classics. Please call the phone number on the screen right now for spiritual help and guidance. that are watching by television, there are hundreds of people coming here at McCormick Place in Chicago to make their commitment to Jesus Christ, to accept him as their Lord, their Savior, as their Master, as the Son of the living God. I'm going to ask you to make that same commitment where you are at home. I'm praying that you'll make that decision. God help you to do it, and I hope that you'll go to church next Sunday.